hosting today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to see some wonderful faces here. This is phenomenal. Some new faces that I haven't met before, but also uh, faces that we've seen coming back again and again, which is wonderful. One of the faces that I love to connect with, and I think we took our master's together years ago, I think I was coming back and helping yeah, You were coming back to help out. Yeah, that's right. You were, you were doing the master's uh, NLP course. And Mike and I reconnected, and we had an absolutely phenomenal time. Uh, Mike is a professional hacker, <laughs> <laughs> right, in the world of uh, security and, and uh, things that he does. And he's always a very uh, dynamic speaker, so it's with great honor that I introduce Mike Murray. Thanks, Ron. And that 
met Stalin Udan and Bill met Magnitogers, the world's largest steel foundry. And Palachinsky worked on that. And Palachinsky basically said, yeah, this isn't going to work either. And again, he was right. So, the third time they came to build one of these world's biggest projects, they decided to solve the Palachinsky problem. One night, Palachinsky woke to a knock on his door, his wife never saw him again. And Palachinsky met the fate, not because he was not a good engineer, he was a great engineer. Probably one of the best engineers Soviet Russia ever created. And yet, it didn't mean anything. Because he really didn't have what the man on the right hand side of this painting had. About the same time, these two, two people got into a similar fight. The one on the left is Nikola Tesla, the one on the right is Thomas Edison. And there was a great scientific battle in the last in the last half of the last century, um, the early part of the 20th century, about electricity. Specifically the type of current. Tesla was a great scientist and realized that the best way to transfer electricity around a power grid would be to use alternating current, which is what we have today. Now, he got into a fight with his mentor, Thomas Edison, who was kind of a crappy scientist didn't really understand the math behind alternating current, couldn't figure out what it was all about, and so instead said direct current's the way to go. Well, it isn't, for those who wanted to know how the fight ends. But this fight lasted for years and years and years, because while Tesla was out with his mathematical equations, Edison took a different tack in creating his own side of this battle. Edison went out and decided to label direct current, or alternating current, as lethal. And started doing things like producing videos and movies of electrocuting elephants with alternating, cur with alternating current. Marketing alternating current as being failing. For 20 or 30 years, we had direct current in all of the biggest cities in North America. Edison even went so far as to be productive. We got something really important out of Edison's marketing campaign. Edison's team went out and invented the electric chair, which used alternating current. We wouldn't have the electric chair if Edison had decided that he wanted to win so badly. And frankly, we have a much better electrical system if Edison had just shut up. But he was such a good salesperson and such a terrible scientist that we spent hundreds of millions of dollars and many, many, many years being distracted by this. This is a picture of my dinner from the other night. <laughs> I went to Weimar. Um, and I, I didn't know what the third story of this talk was going to be until I was at dinner. I'm sitting at dinner with my brother. And for anyone who hasn't been to Weimar downtown, that is the uh, poutine with uh, lobster and um, Bernays sauce. Freedom. Freedom. Oh, God. Um, by the way, I, I've been exiled to the United States for too long. They don't know what poutine is. <laughs> And so I come back to Canada and like for three days I eat routine non-stop. But I realized this would have to be the third part of my talk because lobster is my favorite, favorite story in the whole world. Um, some of you might know this, but in the 1700s when U.S. colonies were first getting started, um, lobster wasn't really considered a delicacy. In fact, lobster wasn't a delicacy at all. Um, lobster was basically the stuff you ended up with when you were trying to catch fish in nets. You ended up catching a bunch of lobster. And it was like 
to that to to the people of the time, it was the equivalent of being fed rat to suggest that they eat lobster. There are even laws on the books in colonial in the colonial United States that said it was cruel and unusual punishment to make a prisoner eat lobster more than once a week. <laughs> Far cry from my team. <laughs> so how did this happen? What happened? Well, in, as the railroads started to be built, they were looking for a cheap source of food. And they realized lobster was plentiful, it transports well, it's really easy to move around. Uh, how the hell do we get people to eat stuff that we can't even feed prisoners? And they realized that if they made it food that only the first class passengers were allowed to eat, Suddenly, everybody would want lobster. And they started to market lobster as a food only available to those in the first class. And a couple hundred years later, lobster is $60 a pound. And lobster is something that we all consider a delicacy. And you all laughed when I said it would be cruel and unusual punishment to feed it to our, to our, um, to our prisoners. And this is the whole point. And this goes back to the story of my dad, because what my dad was really trying to talk about was that the science matters, the science is interesting, but it has nothing to do with anything, really. You can, you can have all the right answers. You can be Peter Malchinsky, and you can be right in a whole lot of ways, but if you can't influence if you can't change the minds of people around you, none of the answers matter. Because it's really not how the lobster tastes. Um, I was funny, I was actually telling my dad and, and his wife this story last night. And she grew up in Newfoundland. And her, she said her stepdad was a fisherman in Newfoundland. And she said he would never eat lobster because it was bottom feeder and you just didn't eat lobster. It's not about whether the lobster tastes good or bad, it's about what we think the lobster is supposed to taste like. We think lobster is a delicacy, so you can put it on my poutine and I think, wow, that's really amazing. Somebody might think rat poutine is a delicacy. But it's all about how it's marketed and all about how it's sold. And so what my dad was really saying to me was, it doesn't matter how right you are if you cannot influence. And, of course, being the idealist at the time, I thought, you know, yeah, dad, you're old. You're part of that older company that likes Microsoft. Go away. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I still say Linux is going to take over the world. And I knew I was right for all of about 10 minutes um, while I was in the business world. And then I realized that I was the smartest guy in the room and nobody cared. They all thought I was an ass. And <laughs> that was when I decided that I had to actually learn a few of these things. And that was around when I met Linda, by the way. Um, shortly after that. And um, yeah, so that's my answer to the knowledge versus inspiration question. And hopefully that's a good